Hello and welcome to ECMATH. Today we're going to look at section 2.6, which is all about graphing rational functions. Rational functions are any function that is a ratio of polynomials. So you'll see a p of x as a numerator function and a q of x as a denominator function. Uh, we'll see a lot of these as we go on, but we're going to start with the most basic rational function y equals 1 divided by x. We're going to start graphing this one by plotting points. Most of the time we won't plot points, uh, at least very many points, but for this one we will. Uh, so let's make a table of x and y. And in this table, we're going to be really sure that we put all different kinds of values. So we're going to start with x equals 0. That's a good value. Uh, and then we're going to do x equals 1. And let's do x equals 5. But we also need to do fractional values. So I'm going to do x equals 1 fifth. And I'm also going to do some negative numbers. So let's do negative 1, negative 5, and negative 1 fifth. Okay, let's start plugging numbers in. Now, when we plug uh, y equals 1 over x, when we plug in 0, this is 1 divided by 0, which is not 0. That's undefined. I'm just going to write und for undefined. Um, 1 over 1 is 1. 1 over 5 is, surprise, 1 fifth, or 0.2. That's all standard so far. But here's where things get spicy. What happens when we plug in 1 fifth? Then we're doing 1 divided by 1 fifth, which is the same as like 1 times 5 over 1, or 5. If you're dividing by a fraction, the result gets larger. Okay, uh, well, let's just finish the table. So negative in front, it's going to have all the same behavior, uh, but a negative is going to be in front. So negative 1 over 1 is negative 1. Negative 1 over 5 is negative 1 fifth. And negative and 1 over negative 1 over 5 is going to be negative 5. Let's take a moment and put all of these into this graph and see what we get. Now, it might seem a little confusing about how to connect these. Um, so maybe if we wanted to, we could add some extra points. Let's just do over here. Um, let's add uh, 2 and 1 half. All right. So when x is 2, y would be 1 half. And when x is 1 half, y would be 2. Let's plot those points also in here. And then we'll just mirror them on the other side. Okay, and now we can kind of start to see how these things might be connected. Here's how we do it. This is a graph that is in two branches or pieces. The first branch is always positive, and it looks like this. And the second branch is always negative, and it looks like this. And these two pieces together make one graph. So all together, both of these pieces are the graph of y equals 1 divided by x. And this is our very first rational function. This is probably the most important rational function for you to commit to memory. So in addition to the two branches of this graph, there are two key features, um, the horizontal and vertical asymptotes. Uh, so those are these lines that you can almost see uh, that here are the x and y axes that the graph looks like it's kind of bending around. And so we draw these with a dashed line usually. They are not part of the graph, but they are lines that the graph obeys. So this line, you can see how the graph is kind of bending around. What it's trying to do is avoid dividing by zero because that would be bad. Uh, and we call this a vertical asymptote, V-E-R-T-I-C-A-L-A-S-Y-M-P-T-O-T. E. Uh, and this has a vertical asymptote. We always list them as equations because they are lines. So we write x equals 0 because that's the equation of a vertical line. This graph also, if you'll notice, uh, as x gets bigger or smaller, like very big or very small, then the graph approaches the line y equals 0. But it never actually crosses it. That type of behavior is called a horizontal asymptote. Horizontal 
and this is at the equation at the line y equals 0. So an asymptote is a line that a graph gets closer and closer to. Um, you, some people think that your graph can never cross an asymptote. Uh, the graph will never cross a vertical asymptote. You actually can cross a horizontal asymptote. It's more about the end behavior, uh, but that's something that we'll talk about a little bit later. So other than just listing what the asymptotes are, there are some special ways that we can describe the asymptotic behavior of any rational function. So let's flip to graph number two, which is a slightly different one. It looks a lot like a graph of one over X, but you'll notice it's got some different asymptotes and we have a different equation. We're going to learn exactly how to find those asymptotes, but uh, I want to show you sort of the special way that we are going to write this behavior. But first we have to draw the asymptotes in and I've, taken this graph and kind of on purpose taken away the grid so that we have to look at the asymptotes. And one way to kind of identify the asymptotes is uh, to use a ruler and just try to center it between the, the pieces of the graph. Uh, we'll do the vertical one first. That's going to be easier. Mm, looks like right around two would be right between the pieces of the graph. So let's plot that as a vertical asymptote. We will prove that it's actually at x equals 2 a little bit later. And similarly, uh, the horizontal asymptote here is going to be at y equals 1. We'll prove that from the equation a little bit later. For now, just trust me that it's going to be right there at y equals 1. All right, so we'll say y equals 1 and x equals 2 are the two asymptotes of this graph. Uh, okay, so let's talk about the left and right end behavior. So that's what happens over here and far over here on the very far left and the very far right. So on the very far left of a graph, we have, you know, imagine this graph continues, continues. We have negative infinity. And on the very far right of this graph, off the page, we have somewhere over there, we have positive infinity. So to describe this behavior, we'd say as x approaches and we list one of the two infinities. Let's do the left one first. As x approaches negative infinity, we write f of x approaches, and then we just give the value of the asymptote. So like if this red line were to continue, it would get closer and closer and closer to this value y equals one. So we say f of x approaches one. By the way, we read that little arrow as approaches. You can use the word approaches if you like, but most people like to write a little arrow. Um, and we also want to describe the right end behavior. It is approaching the same value. If we continue on this way, it's still approaching one. It's just approaching from the top. We don't have a way to, to differentiate that. So we'll also just write as X approaches infinity, F of X approaches one. So this is saying that the left and right end behavior of this graph are the same. By the way, another notation you might see in calculus is something called limit notation. It's similar to this, uh, but you write a little L I M. Usually it's a cursive L for some reason. You write a little L I M and that stands for the limit. And then you write uh, the arrow where X is approaching down there, the limit as X approaches infinity of F of X equals one. That's another way to write this phrase. Our book uses this notation. Some calcul like all calculus books use this notation. So if you'd like to start using limit notation now, that's fine by me. Um, but I will probably keep using this one because it's what our book does. Now it's a little more complicated to describe the vertical asymptote behavior because as you approach from different directions, you get different behavior. Imagine that you're standing on this graph and you are driving towards the asymptote. Notice that as you drive towards the asymptote, in that direction, you're going down. But if you were standing on this graph over here and you approach the asymptote from the right, you would be going up. So in our notation, we need to differentiate whether we're approaching this asymptote from the left or from the right. So let's first talk about how to approach from the left. We write as X approaches, and then we look at the value we're approaching. We're still going closer to x equals 2. So we say as x approaches 2, but we're approaching from the negative infinity side. So we write a negative up here. And that negative means 
uh, from the left is what that negative means. Uh, then we can say f of x approaches, and we list where we're going. Well, if you're going down, then you're going towards negative infinity on the y-axis. So f of x approaches negative infinity. Now, let's look at approaching from the other side. I'm going to change the color of this. We'll just redraw him. If you are on this side of the graph, if you are on the positive infinity side, and you were approaching x equals 2, you would be going up. So the way we write that is as x approaches 2 with a plus up there, which means from the right, uh, f of x approaches positive infinity, because positive infinity is up there. So it's, again, it's x and then y. Um, but here, this little notation up there is not an exponent. I know that's where exponents go. That's just telling you, are you approaching from the left or are you approaching from the right? And depending on what function you have, you might have different like values depending on the direction that you approach an asymptote from. That's not going to happen with horizontal asymptotes because you can only approach infinity from one direction, but it does happen with vertical asymptotes pretty often. Oh, if you want to use the calculus -y limit notation, you can do these little symbols in that notation as well. So let's just this uh, green one here, uh, we could also write that the limit as x approaches 2 from the left of f of x is equal to negative infinity, is how we would write that. And it would be similar to, um, similar on the purple one, we would just replace it with a plus and replace the infinity with a positive infinity. Um, by the way, it's not like, it's not true that negative there means negative infinity. It depends on the graph, so don't, don't get uh, overexcited about this stuff. Okay. Let's keep looking at features of this graph. We've talked about how to describe the asymptotes, but that's not the only thing that's going on. In fact, I want to zoom in, especially on this little feature right here. This is called a hole in a graph. Uh, that represents a single x value where the function is undefined, uh, but then the function skips right over it. So it's just a, a single hole in the domain. And remember that a point is like, infinitely small. So it's just a single, single value. It's not a big gap in the domain. It's just a single value. And there's a way you can find it from the equation. So there's a lot of stuff in the equation we can find. We can find the asymptotes. We can find the holes. That's what we're going to look at now. But to do it, we need to grab this equation and actually work with it a little bit. So we're going to take this equation and rewrite it down here and start to do some factoring. Here it is. Uh, on the top, Let's look for two factors that are factors of negative three, but add to negative two. So we better have a three and a one, but the three needs to be negative and the one needs to be positive. On the bottom, we need factors of six, uh, both negative that add to negative five. So how about two and three? That seems like it'll work. Now, here's what we might notice uh, right away is that on the top and bottom, there is a factor that cancels. That's what's going to cause the whole. So that you have, uh, once you're in factored form, we can reduce out x plus 3 from both terms. But when you cross this out, the original function still has the excluded value or the domain whole that x should not be 3. So and even though when we cross this out and we simplify it into x plus 1 over x minus 2, this maintains the rule that x should not be 3 or x should not be uh, 2, we'll say, or 2. So even though we simplified it out, this rule about the excluded values or the domain stays the same, and that's what causes the whole. So this is saying that there is going to be a whole at x equals 3, because that was the 0 of the value that we canceled out. Um, but we can actually do one better. It sure looks like this hole is kind of at 3 comma 4. Let's prove it. The way you do that is you just take the value that you found of the hole. So this is the still this is the hole. And now that you canceled out the term, you can actually plug it in. So we can do uh, 3 plus 1 over 3 minus 2. Hey, that's uh, 4 over 1 or 4. So this is saying that there's going to be a hole in the graph at 3, 4. 
And if we were graphing, I know I already gave you the graph, but if we were graphing it, you could put that as a point, not a, like an actual point in the graph, but you could make an open circle there and connect the graph and use that as something you, you uh, include in your graph. So uh, some people think that a hole always happens on the x-axis. That's a misconception. Holes are part of, or they're, they're a part of the continuity of the graph, but they, uh, you can find their y-coordinates just by plugging in the value after canceling. Now that we've found the holes and reduced the equation, we can also find all of the asymptotes and intercepts. So the vertical asymptotes are going to always occur at the zeros of the bottom of the equation. Think about one over x. Uh, it had a vertical asymptote at x equals zero because that's where we were dividing by zero. So vertical asymptotes happen when we divide by zero. Uh, so what we can do is since we canceled out this x minus three, all we really have to think about is x plus one over x minus 2. The bottom of the fraction tells us the vertical asymptotes. So this is going to happen. There's going to be a vertical asymptote when x minus 2 is equal to 0, or when x is equal to 2. So if you're asked to find the vertical asymptotes, all you need to do is first factor and reduce, and then look for the zeros of the bottom. X-intercepts, on the other hand, happen at the zeros of the top. So if we have our same function again, x plus 1 over x minus 2, um, if we look at the top, we can say, when is this 0? Well, uh, we're going to have zeros when x plus 1 equals 0. That will happen when x equals negative 1. If x equals negative 1, let's just check it out. Uh, negative 1 plus 1 over negative 1 minus 2 is 0 over negative 3. 0 divided by anything is just 0, and that's why this makes the graph 0. So we should have a 0 or an x-intercept at negative 1, but a vertical asymptote when x is 2. Let's go look at the graph and see if that's true. Oh my gosh, look at this. Right at x equals negative 1, there was a 0, and right at x equals 2, there was a vertical asymptote. So from the equation, we've now proven uh, some of these features, and the only thing we haven't proven is this horizontal asymptote. But to do that, we're going to have to flip to the other side. For horizontal asymptotes, unfortunately, you have to do a little bit of a test. You have to look at some features of the equation. Uh, and what you have to look at is the degrees of the numerator and denominator polynomials. Uh, we know degree is the highest exponent in a polynomial equation when it's written in standard form. And the rules, they go like this. If the degree of the bottom polynomial is larger than the degree of the top, the horizontal asymptote is always going to be y equals 0. That means that the bottom is growing faster than the top, so when x is really big, the bottom is just going to be bigger than the top, and that means it's going to approach 0. So in this case, uh, on top, 4x plus 1, that's a degree 1, and 2x squared minus x plus 11, that guy is a degree 2. So since the degree on the bottom is bigger, uh, sometimes we call this bottom heavy. I think that's a nice way to remember it, because it's just like, you know, you're thinking about something that has more stuff on the bottom, it's just going to sit flat at 0. Bottom heavy. This is going to have a horizontal asymptote. We abbreviate that as HA sometimes, although you should still know how to spell the word asymptote, uh, L of y equals 0. The one we had did not look like that. Um, the one we had had a horizontal asymptote of 1. So what's going on there? Well, that's because it's from the second case. If the degree of the bottom function is equal to the degree of the top function, the horizontal asymptote is going to be the ratio of the leading coefficients. It basically means when x is really big, um, the x parts are about the same size because they have the same degree. And that means that it's going to trend to the ratio of whatever's multiplied to the x powers. So in this case, this is the function from the front, by the way, if you've forgotten. Um, and this is degree 2 over degree 2. And so what we look at are the leading coefficients. The leading coefficient here is 1x squared, and the leading coefficient down there is 1x squared. So the horizontal asymptote is going to be at y equals 1 over 1 
or y equals 1. Let's go back and look at the front. Back and look at the front. There it is. Our horizontal asymptote on the front was indeed y equals 1 because we have followed, uh, we could follow the test and say that it's the ratio of the leading coefficients, 1 over 1. It's not always 1 though. So here's an example uh, where the leading coefficients are something different. So say we had this rational function that we're not going to graph today. Um, but if we did want to graph it, we can notice that, oh my gosh, it's a degree 2 over a degree 2. So the degrees are matching. And that means that we're going to look at the leading coefficients. So in this case, then the horizontal asymptote would be at y equals negative 6 over 2. The ratio of those leading coefficients, that's going to be at negative 3. So if we were to sit down and graph this, we could say that the horizontal asymptote is going to be right here at y equals negative 3. That's how you find all of the asymptotes. All right, so just to recap, if you have a rational function equation, you can uh, find any holes. Whoa, that's usually the first thing you might find. You can find the vertical asymptotes and the zeros looking at the factored form. And then you can look at the degrees to decide if you're going to have a horizontal asymptote at zero or a horizontal asymptote at, well, not zero. Um, by the way, if the degree of the top is larger, I wrote this here, uh, this function does not have horizontal asymptotes at all. It has something called a uh, slant or oblique asymptote, or sometimes even a curvy asymptote. Those are things that are like, like on diagonals. Uh, we're going to cover those maybe in another video, definitely outside of the scope of this one here. To close our work today, I have a little challenge for you. Here are two different equations, and they're unlabeled graphs. Test what you know by looking at each equation and seeing if you can figure out what the horizontal asymptotes, holes, zeros, uh, vertical asymptotes, and y-intercepts are. Uh, if you can, if you figure out what they are, label them on the graph. And then you can see, kind of see what the scale is. Give that a shot and check back in a minute and we'll see how you did. Oh, you're back. Good. Okay. Uh, so let's follow the procedure for check number one here. And the first thing I like to check for is those horizontal asymptotes because that works best when things are in standard form. So to do that, we're going to look at the degrees of the top and bottom. And we notice that this is a um, degree 2 over a degree 2. So we're going to use the test on the right side of the paper, which says that the horizontal asymptote is going to be at the ratio of the leading coefficients. It's going to be at negative 2 over 1. Where's the 1 from? It's because the leading coefficient there is 1. So we have uh, matching degrees. Horizontal asymptote is going to be at negative 2 over 1, which is just negative 2. So we can go ahead and plot that on the graph. Looks like, and again, to draw it, you just kind of get your ruler a little bit in between or eyeball it. You can put that dotted line in. That's going to be at y equals negative, negative 2. Okay, um, to do all the rest of this, we got to factor the whole thing. So let's factor it now. I'm going to delete that, and let's look at the top. The top has a common factor of negative 2 and x. So this whole thing is going to factor out into negative 2 x, x plus 1. And the bottom is a difference of squares, so that's going to factor into x minus 1 x plus 1. Okay, I can already tell we're going to have a hole because we have this term that cancels. So that term cancels out, uh, and that means we're going to have a hole at x equals negative 1. To find the y-coordinate of the hole, uh, what we can do is we can take the reduced version, negative 2x over x minus 1, and we can plug in negative 1 into that. So negative 2 times negative 1 over negative 1 minus 1 is going to be 2 over uh, 1 or 2. So it looks like we're going to have a hole. It doesn't seem right because it's not. So I could tell from the graph something was wrong. And what went wrong is I didn't subtract there. Or I, I, yeah, I was looking, thinking about multiplying instead of subtracting. But really, this is negative 1 minus 1. So that's negative 2. So this should be at negative 1. So we should have a hole at negative 1 negative 1. And hey, sure looks right. So we can start to find 2 and 1 on the graph. We're starting to get some scale in here. All right, the zeros of the graph. 
So from here on out, for these last three, we can use the reduced version. We can think about negative 2x over x minus 1. We've canceled out all the holes. We've already dealt with the horizontal asymptote situation. So we can just use these last, this uh, simplified equation. The zeros are going to be what makes negative 2x zero. So negative 2x equals zero. When does that happen? That happens when x equals zero. So the x-intercept is going to happen right here at x equals zero. Um, the vertical asymptotes are going to be when the bottom is zero. So x minus one needs to equal zero. Where's that going to happen? It's going to happen at x equals one. Here, let's do a little color coding. So that came from the top. This came from the bottom. And we can see the asymptote on here on the page. Let's plot it in. And we can see that happens right at x equals 1. So we got our two asymptotes. And the only thing we need to check uh, add on here is the y-intercept. We haven't talked about that yet. But you do y-intercepts the same as you do them for every other function. Plug in 0. So not setting equal to 0. You just plug in 0. So we have negative 2 times 0 over 0 minus 1. Well, that's just 0 over minus 1 or 0. So uh, when x is 0, y is 0. And our y-intercept is the same as our x-intercept in this case. And that's it. That's how we do it for any kind of graph. Um, if we didn't have the graph here, but we had all of this information, it would be pretty simple to draw the graph. And that's where we're going to go next, like in the next video and in class. Uh, but for now, let's just try this checkpoint number two and see how we did. So right away, we are noticing a function, by the way, that is a lot more complicated than the last ones. Um, rational functions, depending on how many factors they have, how many asymptotes they have, they can have a lot of different features. Um, the more you graph, the more you'll get used to these different shapes they have. And again, well, the, the specific features of the graph are for a later video. But for now, let's look at all the, uh, the main features, asymptotes and holes. So horizontal asymptotes, we look at the degree, and we notice the degree of the bottom is bigger than the degree of the top. So this one is bottom heavy, which means its horizontal asymptote is going to be at y equals 0. And if we go draw a horizontal line at y equals 0, we notice that the left and right ends of the graph, at least, do seem to be approaching 0 as you extend them. You might be noticing saying, hey, Eck, is this possible that you can cross a horizontal asymptote? Absolutely. Horizontal asymptotes are really only about the left and right ends. You can cross them in the middle any number of times. They just have to get closer and closer um, to the end. You can even cross them towards the end. Uh, they just have to get closer and closer. All right. Uh, for the rest, we need to factor this thing out. Well, the top, thank goodness, is already factored. The bottom, we need two factors. Uh, where there's x and x, and we need factors of 4, negative 4, that are going to add to negative 3. So how about negative 4 and positive 1? All right, nothing cancels, so there's going to be no holes. The zeros are from the top, so let's look at the zeros of the top. That's going to happen when x minus 2 is 0. So when x is 2, okay, so that's our first thing we can put on the graph, is the x-intercept, which is right here, this point of crossing the asymptote, that's going to happen at x equals 2. Let's see if we can find these two vertical asymptotes that we can kind of see on the graph. That happens at the zeros of the bottom. So we look at the bottom. We don't multiply it together. We just set each factor equal to 0. So this is going to happen at x equals 4 and x equals negative 1, the opposites of those signs and the factors. Um, before we go to the graph, let's just do the y-intercept. So this one's going to be somewhere. It's not at 0. We're just going to plug in 0. We can plug 0 into any form. Let's just do um, the unfactored form. So it's 0 minus 2 over 0 squared minus 3 times 0 minus 4. Hey, that's negative 2 over negative 4. That's 1 half. So it's usually pretty easy to plug in 0 in either the factored form or the unfactored form. Uh, let's write that in. So that's going to be 1 half. And our VAs, vertical asymptotes, are going to happen right here. At, we'll draw them first. X equals, we said, negative 1. 
and x equals 4. So this would be negative 1, this would be 4. And we can get all this information just from the equation and an unscaled graph. We now basically know where everything is on this graph. That's it, folks. I know that's a lot of tests. Uh, you really do need to know them all to be able to successfully graph a rational function. So that's why we just focused on the tests here in this video and didn't do any graphing at all. Um, the next step is to put it all together and start graphing, but we'll do that next time. Thanks for watching, folks. Let me know what questions you have, and I'll see you next time.